Welcome, and thank you for joining today's webinar, Avoid an Identity Crisis, Know Your Customers Post Third-Party Cookies, presented by Redpoint Global and MarTech. I'm your host, Cynthia Ramsren. Joining us today from Redpoint Global are Chris Tomes, VP of Engineering Data Management, and Steve Zisk, Senior Product Marketing Manager. Welcome to you both. I'll turn things over to you. Thanks so much, and we're very happy to be working with you today and talking with a pretty broad array of customers about identity resolution and the future of third-party cookies and the future of data management in general. But I want to set the tone here first and just talk briefly about what it is that we are actually trying to accomplish when we're using first and third party data and first and third party cookies. And just as a reminder, we're talking about customer experience. Classically, that can mean um, outbound campaigns, product driven or brand driven, but it can also mean the more modern version of uh, inbound style campaigns where we're trying to map and follow a customer journey. In that context, we all understand that the range and amount of customer data that we're looking at today, based on the number of different channels that are around, the number of different devices that customers like to use, the cadence and means by which they do journeys, and of course, a lot of the situational things that come up, including COVID and other kinds of interruptions to our normal flow of business, all tend to affect the data that we get from our customers. So the real core question becomes, what can we as marketers, as customer experience professionals, as customer service professionals do to improve the customer experience? And the focus that we're gonna have for today is what can we do to improve the data and the data quality that we have in order to make that customer experience better. I'm going to turn it over for a little while for our next slide to my friend and colleague, Chris Tomes, to talk a little bit about data quality. Thank you, Steve. Uh, yeah, so uh, first of all, just welcome to the, the webinar. We're really excited to talk about uh, the, the topic today. Um, but as Steve mentioned, you know, what are we going to do in terms of getting data and you know one of the challenges uh, that we see with our with our clients and, and just sort of out there in the in in the, um, the marketplace today is that you know it's 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 getting quality data, and really where that those struggles become are you know. Are my data dirty, right? You know, am I missing data? Is the um, is it inconsistent in terms of how it's collected, how it's formatted, how it's stored? Uh, is there uh, you know quite a bit of error uh, within that data due to data entry or due to lack of validation? Uh, is there a lot of information that's collected that just really just creates noise and 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 provides no no real benefit uh, to uh, you know the organization. Uh, also, we find that a lot of areas of um, uh, of the data within an enterprise is sparse. Uh, we there's there's little validation. There's very little uh, required data to be entered. Uh, so you know you go to a web form, maybe it's just an email address is all that required. But yet there's other there's other fields that can be collected, such as name or address, phone, other ways that could possibly allow the organization to communicate. Uh, with the with with their customers on on various channels, um, and then at the end of the day, there's sort of inadequate data. Uh, you, you know, it's um, it's incomplete in how you collect it. It's um, it's it's a correlated, uh, and you know, again, it's just another way that compromises the quality of the data and ultimately compromises the ability for you as marketers or you as an organization organization to com uh, to communicate. Uh, effectively with your customers. Chris, can you talk a little bit more about uh, some of the distinctions? Like it, it seems to me like potentially inadequate data uh, might be similar to noisy data or dirty data. Well, you know, dirty data in my mind is 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 data that if if it were completely populated or uh, felt there was a trust. Uh, that the data were correctly 
uh, captured, that it were validated, um, then there's there's immense there's immense business value to it. You know, noisy data is we're we're collecting data, and well, you know, maybe it's uh, it's data, but it doesn't really have any sort of uh, benefit to the area of the business that it is. Um, uh, that is intended for. So, example, we've got uh, you know, clients that are in the IoT, or you, they've got internet-enabled devices, and you know some of these devices are very chatty, right? You know, they're they're just they're saying, "I turned on, I turned off, I did this." You know, it's from an operational standpoint, it's 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 information that maybe some area of the organization needs, right? To know how this device, um, how this machine is working and operating. But maybe from a marketer, it's like, well, I don't need to know every time it turned on and turned off. I, you know, I really need to know when they, when the customer did something that is going to impact my ability to respond. Uh, so you know, that's kind that of an example sense. of noise of data. Um, um, so I, I don't know that, if that answered your question, but that's, that's kind of that how did, I see the world. That's great. Um, I want to talk a little bit about. Uh, let's see if I can get the slide. There we are. I want to talk a little bit about third-party data and particularly about the distinction between third-party data and third-party cookies. We all recognize that the data that we have about customers is imperfect and incomplete. And in order to overcome those problems with data, uh, we often will turn to somebody else to get more information about our customers. Sometimes it can be very reliable, things like, oh, can you map for me this uh, zip code to some demographic information or this address to a particular geographic location so that I can figure out what's the weather at my customer's location or something like that. Uh, other times we're looking for other kinds of information with third-party data. Uh, we may be going to an ad tech vendor or somebody like that to provide additional data because at some level we think that the information that we have is not relevant enough, not personal enough, uh, doesn't have the data quality that we want, or uh, worse yet, we may have loads and loads of data in loads of different systems inside our organization, but we're failing to be able to bring it together in a way that allows us to um, really understand who our customer is. The other big reason that marketers are often using third-party data is what I would call shaking the tree. I'm looking for new customers. I want to onboard people. I'm looking for people who may have bought something from me in the long distant past, but I don't have any other means of reaching them. So I reach out to a DSP, to a DMP, to an ad tech vendor, to somebody's closed garden, Facebook or Google or, or um, Amazon or somebody else, and see what I can do to get additional customers in. It's cheap. It's easy. I understand how I can do it. But there are potentially some problems with it. Uh, consumers may not really like to have me using ads to follow them around the network after I've looked at something on their site. They may not want to come back if I've done something to, to fatigue them, to give them too many messages. In fact, 39% of consumers say that based on a Harris poll that we did recently, 39% of consumers say they'll no longer do business with a company that doesn't offer a specifically personalized experience. So if I misuse the data, if I shake the trees too hard, um, I'm going to have problems with being able to understand who the customers are. This tells us all that we need to do a better job with our own brand data and better job understanding who the customer is what their preferences are, how they want to interact. We've got to be able to resolve all those different signals from the customer journey. Chris, can you talk a little bit about how to match signals across the customer journey and what identity resolution is? Sure. So you know, really, if we kind of boil identity resolution down, it is finding commonality uh, within an entity across uh, your your enterprise across those disparate data sources. Now, an entity, if we talk about the classic B to B to C uh, uh, world, this is a this is a a customer or an individual. Uh, it, it could be a household. It, it could even be a residential address. Uh, but you know those those entities are not purely uh, 
that's that's not where we have to we can just we don't have to limit it to that uh, if it's a b2b then we could talk about businesses we could talk about uh hierarchical structures within businesses right so you could be in a uh, division or something right like or that. even yeah within an organization it could be more of the sort of franchiser franchisee mm-hmm. model uh so you know there's a lot of different entities that we can create within the data even even outside of sort of um marketable entities, even identity resolution could be used for products. Uh, so if you've, uh, through either um, uh, mergers and acquisitions or through just sort of product development, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you may have products that are identified or coded differently across the data sources, but you need a way that you can look and go, oh, okay, I understand that in, in, in one source it's coded this way and another source is coded that way, but through um, product names and some SKUs and some other things, at the end of the day, we can bring those together and we can have a cohesive identification uh, of that entity across all of those sources. So really it's about identifying the elements that we would use to uh, first create the identity, right? So let's, if we take a, an individual, you know, name, address, phone, email, these are sort of those common things. Um, and then we're gonna go and grab all of the data from the various data sources. So whether that's your e-commerce, that's your point of sale, or it's uh, any sort of operational system. It could be um, marketing systems, it could be web analytics, it could be really anything, demographics, and it's really, pumping all that data into a identity resolution process that uh, brings all that information together, uses those fields to, to uh, create the identity, to compare the records, and ultimately determine that across the, these disparate data sources, I'm able to identify a person. The, the next most important thing is, uh, once you actually identify that person, can you persist that identity across time? Uh, if you're not able to persist that identity across time, then it's going to be really, really difficult to create that, uh, you know, some people call it a 360 degree view of the customer, a single view of the customer, uh, because uh, at, at, at a given point in time, you know what they've done at that point in time. If you don't have that that full view, you can't see what they've done in the past. So it's really, really important as part of identity resolution that you have a persistent way to um, key and maintain that key across time. Can you talk about that just a little bit more in the context of what you mentioned before, a golden record or a customer 360? Right. So really, this is the this is the 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 ultimate output uh, or the ultimate goal of doing your identity resolution, which is to create the golden record. And, and what that record says is what is the best way that I can identify a person. So if we think about it from a marketing standpoint, you talk about touch points. All right. So what's the best address to send it on? Right. So that could be. Um, you know, any number of rules. It could be uh, based on seasonality. So if you've got uh, a lot of snowbirds in your data set, it could be, you know, they're down, they're down south during the winter and they're, you know, they're back in their sort of primary home for uh, the, you know, the nicer parts of the, of the, of the year. Uh, if it's email, obviously what's the best email address? And those rules also could be what did they, what was the last one that they seem to be engaged on? What's not unsubscribed? What seems to be one that they, um, you know, click links on? So really that golden record is at any given time, what is the best way that I can identify this person? And that usually is netted down to the, the elements of PII. So what's the best way to address them from a name standpoint? What's the best way to contact them on the various different channels, right? So email, mail, um, mobile, uh, social, so forth. Also, what that Golden Records allows us to do is once we create that identity, once, once we actually identify someone and put that key, we now have that sort of complete view of what they have. And at the end of the day, what we can do is begin to create aggregated data sets or summary data sets. So uh, now we can go look across transactions. We can go look across web behaviors and we can begin to create a what I call one-stop shop, right? So instead of every time going and, and, and looking across all the transactions and trying to figure out how valuable we are, we simply just go to the golden record and we go and say, oh, for this particular person, I can see 
you know, what's their lifetime spend, what's their lifetime uh, value, how much did they spend, how much, you know, what kind of products did they buy, maybe in, uh, you know, some sort of timed increments, whether that's the last 30 days, 90 days, six months, a year. So now I have a, a you know, a, a place that I can go and get that information very quickly. Uh, and um, it's also being updated at the cadence and the velocity in which your data are coming in. So as data are sent to uh, maybe your CDP or your identity resolution process, you're updating, uh, you're, you're running it through the identity resolution process, you're updating the, 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 uh, the resulting matched data, and, then, and ultimately you're updating the golden record. So that golden record is as up to date as, uh, you know, in terms of how fast you are sending the data. Can that include predictive elements and, and sort of other kinds of things that we might want to do with machine learning as well? Sure, sure. So, you know, as you run uh, these data through, uh, you know, machine learning algorithms or uh, statistical models, you know, those outputs could absolutely be appended to the golden record. So, again, as a, you know, as a sort of starting point, uh, a marketer can go and say, well, I want to look for people that have, uh, you know, certain um, certain makeups, right? So whether that's uh, you know model scores or it's transactional behaviors, but absolutely you can you can aggregate that data, summarize that data, and attach it to the golden record and provide that and make that available to uh, the organization, and it can be leveraged as part of um, you know marketing activities or other activities within the organization. This all sounds really cool, but it also sounds like it might be. Um, sort of complicated to get it right. Can you talk a little bit more about how we build up that customer 360 or that that golden record? Yeah, you know, it it, it can be complicated, uh, but you know, really, where we need to start is we need to identify uh, what data, what sources of data will will contribute to this. So, where do we house, and within the organization, where do we house? Uh, you know, information for, and I mentioned an entity, right? Well, I'm going to continue to use the sort of customer example, but so where do we house customer data, right? So what are all the different systems that store that? Um, how much history can we get out of that, right? Not just what's the current sort of uh, view of that data, but do we have history we can go back and see previous addresses, previous ways they, they, they identified themselves, um, but if we if we take a look at the technical aspect, you know, identifying the data, identifying the rules in which we we perform those matches, identifying the sort of tolerance or thresholds uh, we want in terms of um, determining whether records are a match or not a match, right? You know, that has to be agreed upon. What really I'm, I'm getting to is at the end of the day, we need to have uh, rules that are agreed upon, uh, you know, across the organization. And what we've found with a lot of our customers is that various various parts of the organization view things differently. Um, and so you know, one of the things that you may want out of your identity resolution is something or identity resolution uh, process or or solution is something that actually supports the ability to create different levels of, of identity resolution. So what the example is, finance may not have as much tolerance for fuzziness within a match, right? There are real, there, there are, um, they're going to make are, a loan. You got to make sure they're, they're talking to the right person. It, exactly. Right. Whereas marketing may look and say, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm willing to go a little bit fuzzy or a little bit, you know, have a, a, a lower, um, or higher tolerance for slight differences in, you know, names or addresses or, or, or whatnot. And, you know, so marketing may say these two people are the same person. Finance may go, we, we just, it doesn't, it, it doesn't score out. It doesn't meet our, it doesn't meet our, our thresholds. So they are two separate people. That's fine and dandy. I mean, at the end of the day, finance will treat them that way. Marketing will treat them slightly different. So that may be one consideration you need to have with an identity resolution solution is at the end of the day, it may need to support multiple levels uh, of identities uh, within the organization. Um, but that gets back to really before selecting technology, before embarking on this, there really needs to be, you know, process is almost as important as the yeah. technology, right? You've got to decide what the rules are. You've got to have a, a, a you know, a sort of um, a, co a, a consensus across the organization as to what are the rules, what are our tolerances, how it's going to work, 
uh, and that needs to be sort of evangelized within yeah. the organization so that um, just where I was going and I, I know we're, we'll talk about this a little later but it seems like uh, even within marketing there may be different levels of requirements like if I'm going to do something like um, uh, honor somebody's request for data deletion as part of GDPR, I may need very specific and stringent requirements about how to find the data on that person that may be different from what I'm doing in my ordinary everyday marketing. That's right. That's right. Uh, Chris, can you talk a little bit more about uh, the kinds of things that you've seen among some of our own uh, customers uh, doing Customer 360 or Golden Record? Yeah, so you know, it, it really runs the gamut. Um, uh, so when we've when we've approached the uh, the creation of a golden record or, or a three hundred and sixty degree view, you know, I, I kind of laid out what you know how we how we talk about it. Um, but what we've really seen is uh, we've seen a lot of fragmentation across the enterprise. So we get uh, you know, for example, we've got a uh, we've got a client that's in the travel industry. They've got a number of different brands within the organization, and and, and none of the brands actually communicate with each other. Uh, so we were that sort of centralized process that brought all that data in from those various brands and really created a customer 360, a single view that allowed uh, the 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 parent company to go, oh, I see customers who have leveraged or used or stayed or traveled with these brands and I can create more effective marketing communications um, and they actually did that by taking all that information and running it through uh, a series of models um, and again wow. those model outputs were attached to the golden record and now marketing was able to ultimately reduce spend um, and reduce the amount of, of communications because you know what they ultimately started to realize is that we were, they were creating a lot of fatigue with their with their customers because all of these different brands were that shared customers were ultimately sending out separate emails and you know you just their customers were being bombarded so not only did they reduce uh, their their marketing spend in terms of um, you know the cost of actually uh, the of communicating with the customers, but they ultimately dr drove up uh, revenue uh, immensely because they were able to send more targeted communications because they had a much better view of of how their customers were interacting across the brands. We are getting to a point where marketers need to trust the data understand the data you know there it's it's becoming more and more sophisticated and if they don't have insight into well how's this going is is my data up to date did it run did it run successfully you know what's the what sort of the quality of the match uh, across time what, what does it look at right now what does it look like over maybe a period of time whether that again that's like a 30 or 69 90 day kind of thing but yes being able to measure that it, all that really um, ultimately leads to the ability to trust the data and go, okay, you know, we've, we've successfully loaded the data. It's all timely. It's, uh, you know, the, the, there's, there's been no um, uh, deviations from, you know, historically what the data has looked like. Okay, I'm ready to go and start to talk to my customers. But if, if, if we can actually start to let marketers know, hey, look, this data, you know, this particular data did not come in today or it just looks the profile of it looks completely off from what we've seen historically. You know that allows the marketer to make a decision and go, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to hold off until someone can give me, or I can I, or yeah. either fix it or I can find out what may have uh, been the problem. You know, because a simple example may be if your the number of transactions is really low. Well, maybe it was a holiday and most of your close your stores closed early, or maybe they didn't open at all, right? So that might be the reason that you see some. Um, you know, see some data anomalies. issues or yeah. anomalies in the data, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. But it at yep. least gives the power to the marketers or the people leveraging this data to say, hold up, I want to find out before I proceed any further. Cool. Very cool. We're going to talk a little bit more about trust in a little while, but um, first I want to talk a little bit about different meanings of identity resolution. This is a little bit of confusion that we've seen in the market. Uh, and it's partly because the term is used in several different ways. The 
the obvious classic way that it's been used by marketers is in the context of trying to do things like paid ads and paid search, where the ad tech services themselves can uh, do things like find lookalike audiences based on information that you provide them. And when you as a brand are providing details of your customers to the, the ad in order to help them um, build out audience segments and look for lookalikes and so on, they're doing identity resolution of your data against data that may have come from other ads to make sure that they're matching uh, customers across multiple different uh, uh, brands and systems in ways to make the data meaningful for bidding, serving, measuring ads, and so on. That typically is with data that is either already anonymous or is being anonymized by them, although um, uh, they may still have access to the original unanonymized data. There are very tight contracts and rules about what they can do with it, how they can share data, and so on. Um, the second area that, that uh, uses the term identity resolution is typically what I would call customer access apps. So um, when you have to log in, when you're uh, uh, using a loyalty card at a store, when you're using a card to, to uh, enter a restricted area that has servers in it at your business or something like that, um, there are processes that may be going through for identi identity verification and validation, two-factor authentication, make sure that, that uh, everything that we're doing to understand who this person is in front of us is an accurate picture. But all of that typically is in a very narrow context. I need to let you into the system or I need to let you into this physical area. And it's not intended as a means of um, tying that identity to all of the other ways that you may be doing business or operating out in, out in the world. Uh, and then finally, the more modern way that we often think about identity resolution is with all of the first party data that I may have across anonymous customers, across known customers that I try to tie together across all of my different systems. So that might be um, uh, that might be just within a marketing arena, or it might include data from a CRM and other customer service systems, uh, warranty systems, product level systems. Lots of different kinds of systems can carry information. And um, the, all of the things that you were talking about earlier, Chris, to, to build out golden records mm -hmm. sort of tie in nicely to those cases. Uh, would yeah. you like to talk a little more about that? Yeah, 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 just want a couple a couple of points around the, the the customer access apps and the and 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 the CDPs. Uh, you, you know, from uh, you have one context but not the whole picture. Uh, you also have to make the assumption that these these systems are managing identification and deduplication. I, mean, I can come up with a bunch of scenarios. Employee, uh, you know, people that leave and come back, they may get different employee ID numbers. So you know, right there, there are going to be two people in it. Uh, you know, with the uh, the 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 sort of um, consolidation of say like the airline industry, which is you know kind of famous for their loyalty programs, you, you know you could be a loyalty member in both of those uh, uh, two airlines that actually merge. Well, you're going to be two two records in a system. So you know really those kind of customer access apps require either the system to try to manage that, or or honestly uh, the, the the customers to manage that. Um, so it's, you know, there is some limitations on some of those. And then, you know, of course, with the CDP, that's the ultimate goal, right? It's the ultimately where you want to bring all those disparate data sources in. You want to do that identity resolution uh, and then marry those, uh, those identities up to uh, the data that uh, all those various sources uh, supply so that you have a, a complete view, a complete, uh, uh, a complete view across uh, the enterprise. That all makes great sense. Let's dig down into the use cases for that a little further. Um, in, in the context of a CDP, there's a bunch of what I would call identity resolution patterns. And these, these sort of correspond to the kinds of use cases which can be pretty simple use cases, things like an abandoned cart campaign, or um, much more complicated use cases. Uh, how do I meet a customer with an appropriate um, uh, cross-sell or upsell offer as part of a buy online, pick up in store deal. 
uh, what do I do in order to, to get a customer to identify themselves so that uh, uh, I can give them more relevant and more interesting uh, offers and information? Uh, how do I make sure that customers' feedback to me uh, is accurately handled and uh, is from legitimate customers and not trolls who might be interested in either boosting or reducing my um, you know, net promoter score or things like that. So for each of these kinds of identity resolution patterns, we need to recognize that we may be seeing signals, bits of information from multiple different channels that use different ways of identifying who the customer is. And we have to be able to sort of provisionally tie those together uh, and or uh, not just tie them together as in this is one person, but match them across multiple different people. You may have something like a, a shared computer uh, uh, in an office area and a house that's used by multiple people or a shared Amazon Prime account where I might be shopping for something one day and my wife or my daughter is shopping for something the next day. And those kinds of patterns require smarter resolution, not just, oh, it's the same customer. Yeah, I, I think you know you, you you hit the nail on the head there, Steve. But if if you look at sort of the top uh, right uh, image uh, within the this this the slide, you'll notice that as you move from left to right, that picture becomes clearer and clearer. And that really is what identity resolution is about, right? At some point in time, you're going to start with uh, sparse or limited information, and you may not be able to link things together. And as you bring in other sources, maybe, you know, something like this is using a simple example, NCOA. All right, well, now I can tie a couple sources together because I had an old address and their new address, and NCOA has provided that link. So really the, the goal of it is as you collect more data is to create a clearer and clearer picture of the customer and how they interact with the business, um, and, and that is the goal. And so that to me is the main pattern. It's just continuously iterating through the match, continuously introducing sources, and uh, and ultimately I, I, I go from sort of a, um, a vague picture to a very clear picture of who that customer is and how they've they've been a how they interact with the business. That all makes really good sense to me. We've we've discussed some interesting use cases here. How can marketers themselves understand what they need to do uh, and make progress towards improving the data so that they can, uh, just as you say, uh, make sure that they're, they're progressively matching accurately and completely with customers. Yeah, so you know, this is um, this is this is sort of where the rubber meets the road. Unfortunately, with um, the first party data, you know, the 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 sort of privacy laws are beginning to really start to proliferate. Uh, you know, we started with California, of course. There's GDPR, and you know, more and more states are starting to hop on this. So, at the end of the day, we are we are ultimately going to be moving more towards um, you know, like I, I would kind of equate it to a classic opt-in model, right? You're going to have to uh, receive consent from uh, your your customers to use their data, and it's going to have to be in very clear, simple to understand terms how that data is going to be uh, be used. So no longer can you kind of bury the 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 use of data and and kind of in your terms, and it has to be extremely clear. Um, this is where I this is where I believe it's going. You're already starting to see uh, the states are starting to do that. I think it's only a matter of time before uh, you know federal government will be involved. Um, and so, well, how do we focus and improve first party data? Well, really, we've got to we've got to incent our customers or incent your customers to provide that data because ultimately they're the ones that hold the the you, you know the the power in that regard. Um, and you need to be able to say. Okay, if you give me your data, I am going to do this, this, and this with it. Uh, I'm going to communicate on this, this, and this channel with you, and I'm going to be, do that for this amount of time. Do you agree? And allow them to either say, I don't want to be emailed, but you can send me a uh, direct mail. You can, you can text message me, uh, and you can do that for a period of six months. So I think once you start to build that trust up in terms of collecting that data and using that data based on what their preference and what their consent is, 
you know, it will become easier and easier for you to be able to uh, collect that data and use it to build the value that, um, you know, build business value uh, within that. But, you know, really, I think we've got to get back to the, the, the point that um, you know, we just got to ask the customers, but they've got to know that they can trust that you're going to use uh, the data how they wish for it to be used. Yeah. And it seems to me that that demands a change internally within the marketer's organization, too. We have to be able to sort of redefine how our relationship with the customer is going to be driven. We have to be transparent about how we're going to use their data. Um, we have to make sure that our own internal measurements of success and value, our KPIs for customer experience, are aligned with the goals that we have for, for improving um, customer outcomes and stickiness and getting customers to engage in that value exchange. Trust is a two-way street in that sense. I, I, you know, you bring a really good point, Steve, because as much as your customers are going to demand transparency and demand um, that, uh, you know, demand the trust that, that you're going to use the data as they've uh, prescribed, I think marketers or anybody in the organization that's using it has got to kind of demand the same thing. Marketers need to demand, hey, look, I need to be able to trust the data, right? I need to have you know, we, we put in the radical transparency. I need to know when data are being loaded, how they're being loaded, what's the data look like, are there issues with it? Because that's going to inform them and go, okay, if there's a problem, then I don't, I don't want to go and start trying to run a campaign. I don't want to start contacting my customers because this may ultimately diminish the customer experience. So I think in the same way that your customers demand that transparency and that um, that trust in you using and storing and protecting their data, you know, marketers or, you know, again, anybody else really using the data has to demand the same thing of the organization. That all sort of pushes us towards the ultimate outcome here, which is if, if we're doing a value exchange with our customers and they are saying, I'll share my data if you make my experience better, as we say on the slide here, um, what does that really look like? What is the customer going to be interested in? And I think that the, the, from my point of view, it's not just about marketing. It's about the entire range of customer experiences that somebody might have in interacting with my organization. They want a personalized experience. They want you to show in every encounter with them that you understand what they're about and why they're doing business with your brand. And they want that not just uh, with you saying, oh, sell, 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 uh, buy, buy, buy. They, they want you to be able to sort of understand what they're um, about aspirationally. The example that I love to use on this is imagine that I've, I've bought uh, a brand new pair of hiking shoes. Maybe the, the next interaction with your brand that just sold me the hiking shoes should be, you show me a picture of um, somebody standing on a mountaintop at sunrise because that meets sort of my aspirational goals at that moment. That tells me that, that you understand why I bought those shoes and what I'm about. And when the time comes to go out on that hike, buy other equipment, replace equipment, do whatever else is there, um, I'm going to turn back to the brand that showed they understood me. Well, we're coming towards the close of the session here, I'd like to give you an opportunity, Chris, to talk a little bit about the future of identity resolution and where you see us going over the next several years. Yeah, I started to hit on this a little bit earlier, but um, really, again, the, 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 the privacy um, is really starting, um, you know, for customer privacy is really starting to, to proliferate through uh, the U.S. There's a number of states that have uh, either have passed legislation or legislation is, you know, currently on the docket. So I, this is something we can't avoid. And what we've seen a lot of our customers already doing is at the end of the day, they're, they're finding the most uh, restrictive uh, set of, of legislation or regulations and going with that. Um, so we already have customers that are going, look, 
if anybody calls in and says, you know, I kind of want to, I want to either be forgotten or understand what data you have on me, which is kind of what, which is what CCPA uh, really boils down to. They're just saying it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they live in a state outside of California, we're going to do it. Um, so you're already starting to see companies just go and say, this is what we're going to do. We're going to treat everybody the same. Um, that way we don't have to, to figure it out. But really, because uh, the privacy is is becoming at the forefront of a customer's relationship with the business. Um, you know, a, a customer, you know, a business is going to have to be more reliant on establishing that relationship uh, and providing the context to the, the customer on how you're going to use the data, how you're what you're going to do with it, how you're going to collect it, how long you're going to use it for. Um, and again, as I said before, that language has to be extremely clear. It has to be in very simple terms that the, those those customers um, uh, can understand. Uh, you, you know, and 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 really, at the end of the day, um, what it begins to do is it really starts to uh, create a wall ar around you know your data garden. Uh, data going out, leveraging third parties are going to become uh, almost a thing of the past because customers haven't opted into that. Right, or it's not been explicitly clear to them that they've yeah. opted into that. So you go. How many people do you know who said, "Yeah, go ahead, take my data and share it with somebody else, so that they can follow me around the net." Exactly. So you know, the 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 days are going to be you, you know numbered, or it's going to be really challenging for you to use third party systems that provide services around data pens or. Uh, even even identity resolution services because you know they use reference files and you know when's the last time you opted into something to say uh, I you know this company can use my data to um, help other companies identify uh, me in their in their data it just doesn't happen so it's gonna be very interesting what happens over the next couple of years and how some of these companies respond but at the end of the day there's going to have to be a contract right you know whether that's some sort of yes. consent contract there has to be a contract between the business and the customer and um, you, you know it, you have to provide to the the customer Here's how I'm going to use your data. Here's what we're going to collect, and they have to be able to, um, you know, change their minds. They could, they could say yes, you can email me, and then tomorrow they could change their mind. And you have to provide them the facility to do that. Um, and, and that you know, becomes, by, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, go ahead. That becomes just one piece of this real-time resolution picture. If right. a customer has already said these are the things you're allowed to do, and these are the things you're not allowed to do. We need to make sure that in every interaction, in every channel, we know um, what the impact of collecting that data is, what the impact of the kinds of interactions that we're going to do with the customer are, whether we're allowed to do them or not, whether we're allowed to collect the data or not, and what we're allowed to do with that data all have to be understood in the moment. Well, yeah, I mean, you see it now, right? There's there is current legislation around uh, unsubscribing emails, right? You, you know, businesses are uh, required to remove uh, an email off of an email list or unsubscribe an email, but they have a period of time to do it, and you know, that's it's days, weeks, if not, you know, I don't remember exactly the number, maybe it's thirty days, but that may be reality. But what does the customer expect, right? You send an email the next day, and yeah, they're upset, right? I removed myself from the email list. Why am I still getting emails? Well, you know, I don't know the laws because it's not, not made clear anywhere. So, it, you know, I think it's a very, very good point that, you know, as soon as someone says, I don't want to be treated in this way, being able to do that in real time or near real time will ultimately improve the customer experience because you have honored their wishes. That makes really good sense and is clear in the context. It's basically asking us to go beyond what the laws say and to be driven by the actual expectations and desires of the customers in that interaction. Right. So we have some time for some questions. Uh, I'm sure some questions have been coming in and uh, uh, I'd love to hear them and Chris, you and I can answer them. Okay. Great, thank you both. We do have a number of questions, so uh, I'll just get started with the first one. Who should spearhead these identity resolution programs in place at our organization? Who is best to be involved? Uh, if I can jump in on that, I, I'm gonna say that there's a great big it depends to start with that. Um, 
it depends on where the business and tech ownership for customer experience is within your organization and how that interacts with identity. For many companies, there will be some operational um, groups like the chief customer officer or a director of customer experience who are in charge of customer experience across the entire organization. For other organizations, um, uh, it may be much more um, IT focused with a CDO or a CIO in charge of it. Uh, and for yet others, it may be specific to which departments are interacting with a customer. So the CMO might be the person in charge. But the big thing that I would say there is you're probably going to want to ultimately build or enlist a cross-functional team that's looking at things like privacy compliance, customer experience, um, tech capabilities that might be there in services of those platforms. Did you want to add anything to that, Chris? No, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. It, re, it is really, a, it depends, but I think you kind of, you did a nice job of covering sort of the, the, you know, the various areas or people that might be involved with the process. Excellent. Our next question is from Jason, who asks, how do you quantify the challenge in translating behavioral signals into usable insights? Would you consider that a challenge with the data strategy and insight frameworks rather than the data itself? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the data simply speaks for the customer. The data represents some small signal that the customer has. And it really is up to the intervening tech, if you will, to understand what to do with that signal. But all of that is being done, of course, in a context of, of what are the, the goals and processes that are being put in place by the the um, group that is collecting those signals and bringing them together. There are some very specific kinds of technical challenges, things like um, uh, being able to, to uh, normalize non-normalized text or even to, to do things like uh, recognize the, the which if, if I have a sequence of names that represents the name of a customer, which is which are the first names, which are the last names, how does that differ from one region to another, uh, and how do I understand how to parse and pull apart that information in order to do it. So there's, I guess what I'm saying is the challenge breaks down into um, what do I do with this signal to clean it up, to understand it, to make sure that I've sort of enhanced the signal itself. And then separately, what do I do with that signal in the context of all of the other pieces of information that I might have? So now I've got a name. How do I match that name with this other name over here? Is my name Steve or is it Stephen? And what's the likelihood if I see one or the other of those names along with the other bits of information I may have in a signal that I can accurately identify it with Stephen's disk? Chris, do you want to expand on that a little? Yeah, really what I was going to say is, you know, even though I've been implementing these these sort of solutions for, you know, better part of 20 years, uh, it really does, I think, the challenge is always back to strategy or process and design. Um, you know, the technology is, you know, once you understand what you're going to do, once you get consensus, you know, then that's not to say it isn't a challenge, not to say it there isn't a complexity to it. But if we don't have a strategy, if we don't have a consensus, you know, ultimately, you know, you're going to build shelfware, right? You're going to build something that uh, isn't going to be adopted, isn't going to be used, um, and you know, you're because you're, it isn't going to be useful, to, right? You're back to square one. So I, I, you know, Jason, I think, in my opinion, uh, it's 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 always the challenge is going to be in the strategy and getting getting an understanding across the enterprise and and um, you know how you're going to attack this and make sure that, that that the consensus is there. Okay, thank you both. Our next question is from Renu. She asks, uh, where does data cleansing fit into creating the golden record? All right, I'll take this one. Um, this is kind of my uh, in my wheelhouse here. Uh, so, uh, Renu, the the 
you know, it's always best to do the hygiene prior to going into the actual identity resolution process. Now, I personally will uh, lump data hygiene as part of the identity resolution process. I would actually say that the, the, the portion where you are comparing the records and determining uh, 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 similarities with uh, or, you know, like entities across the day, I call that matching uh, data hygiene is paramount to uh, cleansing and hygiening and, and, and preparing the data before you go into the matching. And here's why, uh, you know, Steve alluded to some of this, but when you bring data in from all these different sources, you're going to get things like this source has a full name. This source has the name uh, broken out by first, middle, last. This source has a full name, but it's, it's last name, comma, first name. Uh, so there's no consistency. Uh, there's, no, there's no standard pattern. Right. So now we need to go actually run it through a process that creates a, a standard set of fields. Right. First, middle, last. Uh, so we have to parse the data where it's not already parsed. Um, you know, maybe we actually have parsed data that's in an incorrect field. We've got last names and first names and first names and last names. You know, so doing those kind of things. So the more that you can parse the data, cleanse the data. Uh, the better results you're going to get out of the match process and ultimately the better your golden record is going to be. So yes, data hygiene happens before you actually run it into the, the process where we identify um, uh, common, uh, common data or commonality across the data. And then you know, that, that, that the output of the match process then goes into the golden record to create uh, the best of record uh, for an individual or for that entity that you you ran through the identity resolution process. Yeah, and just to be clear, um, in our opinion at Redpoint, you're you're never going to throw away the original raw data. You want to make right. sure that you're hanging on to the information as entered and produce, if you will, those intermediate standardized, normalized versions of the data that can then drive. Um, uh, matching. And same thing is true post-match. If we've decided that two signals belong together, you don't throw away any of the data from either of those signals. They become additional attributes. And you may have to make a decision about things like which of these phone numbers do I want to treat as a primary phone number. And that goes into the golden record part of the record. But all of the attributes get pre preserved. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, uh, and it's for both of you. And I just want to know if you have any advice for our attendee, Mark, who says the challenge we face is non-standardized data more than anything, so it's not able to be leveraged. So I think we kind of answered a piece of that in the answer that we just provided before. The only other thing that I would add is that um, uh, there is room, and I'd love to have Chris talk about this briefly, there's also room for man in the middle kind of scenarios where we can do things with standardizing, cleansing, matching, uh, and decide that we had a good match on this, we, we know we had a bad match on this, but somewhere in the middle is data that may actually need a human touch in order to uh, be accurate with it. Yeah, so uh, you know, not know exactly what they mean by non-standardized data or what what type of data it is. Um, you know, there's a couple ways we can attack it. If it's well understood, uh, data classifications or categories. You know, I use an example: addresses. Right. Well, that can kind of come in non-standard ways. It could be all kind of shoved into one field. There could be a city in the in the address one field. You, you, you know, when you look at these. When you're looking for an identity resolution uh, solution or you know a data hygiene solution, you got to look for things that they you know they have address refielding or they've got the ability to create custom parsing, uh, the ability to leverage reference sets. Um, you know if you look at uh, Redpoint provides a data management product and we certainly have hygiene uh, capabilities within it. We do address standardization, right? You know at at the core of it, it's actually large reference data sets underneath you're doing parsing you're doing the, the matching so uh, mark I'm not quite sure what you mean by um, non-standardized in the sense if it's if it's something that's a well understood 
uh, data entity or classification or category, then, you know, absolutely, we deal with that all the time, and we have tools that help us deal when, you know, it just kind of comes in, in, in forms or formats that you aren't really how we would, we would say, per se, look at that. Um, so now, if it's something that's not, if it's uh, specific to your business, uh, but it's still well understood, you know, that I think what you're looking for in, a, in an identity resolution or a data hygiene solution is the ability to create custom rules uh, that fit your patterns, that fit uh, your business rules, uh, and also can be customized with reference data sets and things like that to be able to um, you know, extract pieces. If you know, we get back to that noise, right? If you've got noise within the the the, the data, uh, but you're looking for patterns or or specific elements that you're pulling out of it, you know, then I would encourage you to look for a solution that would allow you to um, customize that or has uh, capabilities that will address uh, the type of data that you're talking about. Okay. Well, thanks again to Steve and Chris for this engaging presentation. We had a ton of questions, so if we didn't get to your question, we will be sure to pass it along to the presenters. I want to thank everyone in our audience for attending this webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day.